Hello everyone, welcome back. After a short break, I'm back to scale modeling. I wanted to start the Soffit Camel from Edward in 1 in 48 scale, but when I opened the box and I checked the sprues, I realized that Edward offers all four engines this aircraft has used over the years. The Norm, the Lerun, the Clarget and the Bentley. This gave me the idea to build all the four engines. What's more, I had a present from a club member who gave me three Wingnut Wings 1 in 30 second scale engines. One of them was a Norm Omega. Perfect, we have five beautiful engines, let's build them. I built all five engines simultaneously, but grouped the video footage for a better presentation. So the first victim is a 7 cylinder Gnome Omega from Wingnut Wings in 1 in 30 second scale. Obviously this was the easiest patient. The quality is second to none, there are super fine details, but I wouldn't say I like this half engine block design. It's not the best because after gluing the two parts, we have to manage the seam lines in between. So we send off the fine details. Other than that, it's just perfect out of the box. The other four engines from Edward in 1 in 48 scale, mid scale as I usually call it. Even though it's not the smallest scale, these engines are so tiny. They are so small compared to the World War II radial engines like the Pratt & Whitney Double Wasp or the BMW 801. At the end of the video, I show the difference between them. Basically, I made the same process with all the engines. I slightly upgraded them with 0.3mm brass tubes for the push rods and the spark plugs and 0.1mm copper wire for the ignition wires. I changed the push rods except at the Lerun because for my taste the plastic rods were too chunky. I also changed the spark plugs but only with the Omega, the Clarget and at the Bentley. At the Norm and the Lerun the spark plug position was such that it wouldn't have been easy to drill them. For weathering I used animal and oil washes. Though these engines bathed in castor oil, I did not want to overweather them. I'm going to use only the Clarget engine in my Camel. I build the other ones just for fun and to show you how to upgrade them. Obviously when I build the Clarget into the Camel, I will apply more weathering on and around the engine. The Gnome 7 Omega, or as commonly called Gnome 50, is a French designed 7 cylinder rotary aero engine. Called it Gnome 50 because it produced 50 horsepower from its 8 liter capacity. The engine was introduced in 1908 and first flown in 1909. Henri Farman installed the engine in his biplane, which maiden flight was in April 1909. More than 20,000 Gnome of different models were made by the end of World War I. Interesting, the very first, the serial number 1 engine is on display at the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. Ok, so let's speak a little bit about the rotary engine. The rotary engine is basically a standard 4-stroke engine with the cylinders arranged in a star shape. The usually odd number cylinders 5, 7 or 9 are radially around the central crankshaft. And here comes the twist. The crankshaft is fixed and stationary and the whole cylinder block rotates around it. The propeller was bolted on the front of the cylinder block. One of the advantages of the spinning engine was its self-cooling ability. It means that the rotating engine generates its cooling airflow around the cylinders. It doesn't need a complex cooling system for the operation. Because of the effective cooling abilities, the engineers were able to achieve significant weight savings by using cylinders with thinner walls and thinner and shallower cooling fins. Weight is crucial in aviation, especially in these early years because these engines weren't extremely powerful. Also a good thing is that the spinning engine is a relatively large rotating mass that acts as a flywheel. However, there were downsides of this design as well. There was no oil system to lubricate the engine. The way of lubrication was genius, but quite primitive. The lubrication system in rotary engines is a total loss type that pumps castor oil into the fuel-air mixture just as in two-stroke engines. 
castor oil is preferred because of its excellent lubrication qualities and inability to dissolve readily into the fuel. During each hour of flight, gallons of castor oils are sprayed into the air. Another issue was the gyroscopic precision of the rotating mass, which led to stability and control problems. The engine's rotating mass acted as a big gyroscope, affecting flight characteristic during turns. When the aircraft turned left against the engine rotation, the engine's rotating direction made it harder to turn and caused the nose to pitch up. On the other hand, turning right was much easier and the nose turned to pitch down. These characteristics could be advantages in certain situations such as dogfight, but it could be a nightmare for inexperienced pilots. It was not particularly noticeable during level flight. All in all, the rotary engine was widely used during World War I but quickly reached its limitations. The king of its kind was the Bentley BR2, the most powerful single rotary engine of the era. The Gnome 9B was a very simple design. It had a single exhaust valve operated by a pushler on the cylinder head. On the other hand, the pressure opened intake valve was in the piston crown and it would open by inertia during the downstroke and allow the fuel air mixture to enter the chamber from the central crankcase. There was no throttle control on this engine. The pilot could only control it by turning the induction on and off, on and off. Because of its simplified design and fewer moving parts, this engine was reliable but it was tricky to operate, especially during landing, compared to the other rotary engines. However, the simplified design had several drawbacks. The cylinder heads had to be removed to maintain the intake valves, and this engine was very thirsty as the intake valves could not close or open in an optimal time. Later engineers upgraded the engine to increase the overall performance. The latest version was the 9N. It was equipped with dual ignition system and improved reliability. Gnome was produced in larger numbers under license in Great Britain, Russia and in the United States. Another French design rotary is the Le Rhin. It was produced from 1910 to 1920 in many different variations. During World War I it was used by every air force because before World War I the licenses were sold to Great Britain, Russia, Italy and Germany and many other countries. Iconic World War I aircraft used this power plant like the Newport fighters. Uh, the Soffit Pop or the Soffit Camel, or its famous rival, the Fokker DR1. So it wasn't rare to see a dogfight between a Camel and a Fokker equipped with the same engine. It was the same as all rotaries, fixed crankshaft and rotating cylinders. One of the main differences between the Lerun and the Gnome was the mounted carburetor on the shaft and the fuel-air mixture was piped to the intake valves by a copper tube. In some versions, these copper tubes were at the front of the engine, while in other variants these tubes were behind the engine. Using the carburetor was a significant advantage over the norm, as the pilot could throttle the engine, which made the flight much easier and the fuel and oil consumption was much more efficient. Another unique design element was the unconventional valve actuating system with a single push-pull rod. So one rod controlled the exhaust and the intake valves. 
When the rod moved up, it opened the exhaust valve, and when the rod moved down, it opened the intake valve. This system reduced engine vibration, however, it limited the power output, as it prevented valve overlap. Valve overlap is an important setting. After the piston reaches the top position during the exhaust stroke, some exhaust gases may linger in the cylinder. These gases are combining with the incoming fuel air mixture, therefore degrades the efficiency of the mixture. To solve this issue at the beginning of the intake stroke, the exhaust valve should be open a little bit and the unwanted gases could leave the combustion chamber. With this valve actuating system, the two valves cannot be open at the same time. Overall, the Lorraine was a successful engine design and its versions were produced for many years after World War I. The Clarget 9B is another famous rotary designed by the engineer and inventor Pierre Clarget, produced in France and under license in the Great Britain. Pierre Clarget designed engines mainly for airships. He had a famous four-cylinder water-cooled 9.9-liter .9 engine that produced 100 horsepower and the weight-power ratio was excellent for this engine. Pierre Clarget wanted to design an engine that was small and lightweight but powerful enough. The rotary engine met his requirements, but he wanted to design something better than his rivals. He created two basic models. A 7-cylinder model was around 60 horsepower and had 12 liters of capacity, and it was only 100 kilograms. The 9-cylinder version, the Clarget 9A, was a bit over 100 horsepower and had a capacity of 16 liters. These engines were quite thirsty, they consumed over 40 liters of fuel and 5 liters of oil per hour. The 9B model I built from Edward was widely used during World War I. Thousands of units were built. The anatomy of this engine was more conventional than the norm or the Lorraine. Its cylinder head was more traditional with two separately operated valves, one for the intake and one for the exhaust. An induction pipe behind the cylinder carried the fuel-air mixture from the carburetor. He designed two magnetos with two spark plugs for safer ignition. This design was more advanced than the norm and simpler than the Lorraine. Many engine components, including pistons, were made from aluminum alloy, which made the engine lighter. The Clarget engines were known for their reliability, but the special purpose piston ring called obturator rings were a source of failure. The purpose of these rings was to block heat transfer from the combustion area to the lower part of the cylinder, but they often got distorted and had a short lifespan of just a few hours. Like the Lorraine, the Clarget featured a throttle for engine speed control. Although the engine was powerful and reliable, it was quite expensive to produce compared to the Norm or the Lorraine. An interesting fact about Pierre Clarget is that in 1943 the designer was found dead in one of the Perry canals. The circumstances are unclear, probably he committed suicide. The Bentley BR-1 was a British aircraft engine designed by the famous motor car designer Walter Owen Bentley. During the war he was served as an officer in the Royal Navy. He was a liaison officer between aero engine manufacturer and the Royal Naval Air Service. Bentley was dispatched to Guinness's factory in London, where the Clarget 9B was licensed produced to improve the engine's reliability. Unfortunately, their collaboration was not without problems. Guinness's management disagreed with Bentley about technical questions. 
As a result, Bentley left Guinness and moved to work with Humber Engineering. It was a bare move because, up until that point, Humber produced only bicycles and field kitchens. Designing and producing an aircraft engine is slightly different from designing and producing a bicycle. Humber Engineering helped Bentley to work on his ideas. The result was the Bentley BR-1 rotary engine. The BR-1 looks quite similar to the Clarget 9B, but he improved the cylinders and increased the stroke which allowed more power. He kept the two separate pushrods for the valves and used double magnetos with two spark plugs per cylinder. The engine was known as AR-1 Admiralty Rotary 1, but later rechristened to BR-1 Bentley Rotary 1. The BR-1 became the best engine for the Camel, but they couldn't build enough, though the BR-1 was considerably cheaper, about two-thirds of the price of the Clarget 9B. At the end of the war he designed the BR-2 engine, a bigger, heavier and more powerful rotary that performed around 230 horsepower. Probably in the BR-2 the rotary engine design reached its limits, and the BR-2 was the last rotary engine adopted by the Royal Air Force. It's an interesting story that even though the BR-1 was named after its designer, inventor Bentley, Bentley didn't hold any commercial rights after his creation because during the war, as a Navy officer, it was his duty to improve aero engines. However, in 1919 he was awarded with a single payment of £8,000. After the war he founded Bentley Motors Limited and became a successful auto motor designer. The very first rotary engine was a motorbike engine in 1888. Felix Millet had patented it and the five-cylinder rotary was built into the rear wheel of a motorbike. The first rotary engine used in aviation, produced in significant quantity, was the Gnome Omega. The last step was weathering. I like to use light weathering on my models. Though these engines bathe in castor oil, I use light weathering on them according to the pictures and the videos that I saw in the internet. I mixed a light, highly diluted black oil mix, followed by earth brown and finally dark brown. I prefer a diluted mixture of oil or animal because I can apply it layer to layer and it's easier for me to control how much effect I want to achieve. Here we can see how tiny these rotary engines compared with a World War II engine. This is a Pratt & Whitney double wasp that I built a while ago, and the other one is a Japanese sake engine for my future Zero project.
I like building engines and these unique rotaries gave me lots of fun to make. I also learned a lot about rotaries during this process. The Eduard engines are excellent, but with a touch of extra work we can make them even better. The Wingnut Wings Omega is also really nice and easy to build. Hopefully this company will return someday and make beautiful kits for us. If you enjoyed what you've just seen in this video or in my videos, please hit the like button and click subscribe with the little bell and you won't miss the next episode. What's more, share my channel with your modeler friends. It really helps and keeps my motivation high. Thanks for watching and see you next time.